Good morning, brothers and sisters. Always nice to be here. I love this place. There's a lovely atmosphere when you come in. When you go to certain temples, you get that feeling. Some places don't have it. Okay, and I always have a feeling. My topic today is gratitude. Uh, I would like to begin by remarking that a lot of people uh, tell me, you know, they find very, Buddhism very difficult to follow. You know, to begin with, to know about Buddhism, you've got to sit on the floor two hours, you know, backache, cannot complain because it's part of suffering. Okay, and so it's very difficult, very easier to go to other religions, you just you know, just pray and say, okay, you do the rest. I, I have my faith. But Buddhists, you are supposed to think. And you're supposed to develop yourself. You're supposed to understand. It's very, uh, very difficult. That is not true at all. Unfortunately, we have given the impression that Buddhism is a very difficult religion to follow. A lot of things that need to be done, which are not required by other religions. That's not true. Yeah? I would like to tell you that Buddhism is actually one of the easiest things to follow. You don't need to go through all the Nikayas. You don't need to go through all that uh, studies. You know, that make your life miserable. Because the Buddha himself said, Monks, I only teach one thing. Suffering and its end. I only teach you that. And what he means is, when suffering ends, what do you get? Happiness. So you want to be happy? Come to me. That's all he says. We then go ahead and suffer in order to be happy. Okay, when we do all of this, which is, I want to assure you it is not necessary. Well, I won't say it's not necessary. I've got to qualify that. The Buddha never called his religion Buddhism because he didn't speak English. Okay? Uh, he called his religion Buddha uh, Dhamma Vinaya. It wasn't a religion, it was a mind transforming method. That, that, that was all it was. It was not a religion where you talk about going to heaven or whatever. It was how to convert your mind. Convert your mind to what? From unhappiness to happiness. That's it. It is as simple as that. And then in order to do that, oh, I, I got way late. Dhamma Vinaya. He says, my teaching has to do with theory, doctrine, and vinaya practice. So these two must go together. So we are not saying that it is not important to know the sutras. We are not saying that it is not important to understand what you are doing. But we are saying, don't get stuck there. From this knowledge that you gain, you must be able to apply it. That is why we call it an experiential religion. You must experience. Ehi pasiko. Come and see for yourself. All right? you, you, you have to understand this uh, practice. And it is akalika. Akalika meaning timeless. Timeless means you will see the results immediately. So the Buddha says, whatever it is I teach you, you are not enough. Dhamma, Vinaya, doctrine, practice, not enough to know, not enough to know alone. You must be able to put it into practice and when you put it into practice, you will see the results immediately. When you see those results immediately, Akalika, yeah, that is where you get happiness. That's where you get the happiness, okay? So, it says there, don't worry about too much of theory. Try and put it into practice as soon as possible. And the Buddha says, I teach you to be happy. Unique in Buddhism, again, is that you want that happiness. Most religions will tell you it's pretty difficult to be happy in this life. Everything is messed up, you know. 
trees fall where they're not supposed to fall. You know? And then the moment that they, the trees fall, they go around cutting every other tree around the town. Okay, And this kind of mess, you don't need to be part of that. I will teach you happiness. I will teach you how to be happy. No need to have all that studies. Yeah? Ehi pasiko. Okay? Akalika. This happiness, don't wait until you die to experience this happiness. Because we don't know if there is a heaven out there. That's a frightening thought. Literally, in the Agganya Sutra, the Buddha says this. Sorry, Kalama Sutra, the Buddha says this. He says, we all do good, and you know how difficult it is to be good. Yeah? And we all do good, we do good, we do good. Why do we do good? So that one day we will die and go to heaven. So all this good work, then the Buddha asks you, you do good, you do good, it's no fun to be good. And then in the hope that one day when you die, you will go to heaven. What if, the Buddha says, you go to, you die, and then there's no heaven out there. Wasted. Okay? He says, so don't be good in order to go to heaven. Heaven is here and now. That's why we have the four Brahma Viharas. Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka. Four states of mind. And when these four states of mind, when you develop Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka, when you develop these states of mind, there is no room for the causes of unhappiness, which are loba, dosa, moha. Ignorance. Yeah, because of ignorance, we have greed. Because of greed, we have frustration. And our whole life, we are unhappy. We are unhappy because these three things are devouring us. Loba, dosa, moha. All right? So, get rid of loba, dosa, moha. You are free. You have happiness. So, all that you need to do is to practice happiness. Now I come to the topic itself. I forgot what I'm supposed to do. You were carried away. Anyway, <clears throat> one of the ways, one of the simplest ways in which to experience happiness, not in heaven, but here and now at this moment, <clears throat> is to develop, we already said this, in a state of mind. To develop a state of mind. And what is this state of mind? A simple way, the Buddha says, is to experience gratitude. Gratitude is a very positive way of developing the mind, keeping the mind, and it is to be experienced this moment. And if <clears throat> you practice gratitude, which anybody, you don't have to be clever, you don't need to know, know all the sutras, you don't need to know Pali. As long as you can experience Gratitude, and that this word experience is very important. In Buddhism, it's not theory, but it is practice. Dhamma, Vinaya, practice. And how do you practice? You practice, one of the things we can practice is gratitude. And gratitude is very central, because gratitude gives you a state of mind, a happy state of mind. And if you live in a sense of gratitude, here we are going to talk only about parents, but gratitude just to be alive. Gratitude that it's not raining now there. You know? Constantly, if you look at the world positively, then you create positive states of mind. If you create positive states of mind, you don't need to die. You are already in heaven. Okay? So, that, that is the... The, the basic teaching of the Buddha. So he has a very simple way, the Buddha says, that you want to be happy, I will teach you how to be happy by practicing. Okay? This is a, the practical part of Buddhism. Okay. Now, how, how important is uh, gratitude in, in, in the Buddhist practice? It is underlined 
by the Buddha's experience himself, by the Buddha's, uh, uh, but not experience, the Buddha's uh, example, the Buddha's example. Where is the tick tick? Oh, here. The, uh, this one. Oh. Ah, yes. The very before when the Buddha got enlightened, all right, as you know, he got enlightened and he spent, yeah, seven weeks in the same spot where he gained enlightenment, all right? And people say that he gave his first sermon, yeah, he gave his first sermon after three months of his enlightenment. But that is not where his career began. The Buddha's first teaching was given, get this, the Buddha's first teaching was given without even speaking a single word. He was enlightened and he gave his first sermon. His first lesson yeah, was given without a single word. And that first lesson was he got enlightened and he spent one week enjoying the bliss of Nirvana. It was such a lovely experience that he spent a whole week in that same spot under the tree. Now, the second thing he did, that yeah, first one was enjoying the bliss of enlightenment. He went to a little hill. That the, 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 If you go to Bodh Gaya, you'll see that. That's the tree, all right? And in front of the tree, there's a little hill, about that, almost like that. And he will goes up to the tree, uh, the, the hill. You're looking for the hill there. It's, uh, okay? <laughs> you can go pil pilgrimage after that. Uh, about the same height there. And he stood on that tree, turned back, and looked at the tree for an entire week without blinking. For a whole week, he just stood there looking at the tree. What was he doing? He was expressing his gratitude to the tree. It was only a tree. All right? It was only a tree. Yet, he took the time to express his gratitude to the tree. It's a very important lesson because it <coughs> deals with our state of mind. Ingratitude is a very, very negative state of mind. Yeah? And as you know, in, in the political situation in this country, it's very easy to develop negative thoughts. Yeah? Not realizing that these negative thoughts react badly towards us. Yeah? So it, it's very important to look for excuses to practice gratitude. And there's a lot of that around. Not just here, anywhere in the world. You can be grateful or you can be ungrateful. You know that, that say, famous thing about the glass of water. You can say either it's half empty or if it, it is half full. You want to look at half empty, the whole world is a terrible place. Yeah? You look at the half full, there's a lot of scope for happiness. Okay? So the Buddha's first lesson was that he paid his respects to the Bodhi tree, teaching us that if you want happiness and if you want to follow the Buddhist path, this is where you begin. You don't begin by bribing the Buddha with joysticks light, lighting and all that. This, this also come, but this is one way of expressing gratitude. But develop your gratitude. It gives you a lot of positive states of mind. It reminds me, this is buy one, free one. This is a Christian story. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I love. One day, Jesus Christ was walking along the road and with his disciples. And he was walking along the road with his disciples. He saw, they saw a dead dog. This dog had been dead for about a, a, a week. So it was hot and the whole thing was bloated and there were worms all coming out. And all the disciples looked, Ew, dirty, Ew, yeah. Yeah? Look at the worms, look at the pus, look at the skin. But the, Jesus said, look at the teeth. The dog's teeth are how beautiful. You can look at all the bad things. But if you look 
closely enough, you can find something beautiful. Okay? So, in our situation, in order to be grateful, we can look around for that which will make us grateful and gives us the proper state of mind. Okay? So, that was one. The other one that he taught was, he, one of the first things he did, as you know, was after his enlightenment, he went and gave the first sermon. And the first sermon he selected was to give it to the five ascetics. Why? Because he, uh, they were there for him for five years. They, uh, for six years. They were there with him. They looked after him, his needs and all that. Then towards the end, they lost their faith in him and they left. All right? But when he gained enlightenment, he said, I have gained so much important word, happiness by following this path. Yeah? And I cannot keep it to myself. I have to share it. I get nothing out of this. Once I've gained enlightenment, I become an Arahant, I, I can't benefit from any other source. I'm already perfect. But I cannot keep this secret to myself. So he goes and he says, who is the most worthy to receive this teaching. And he remembered these five ascetics had been with him, looked after him for five years. So out of gratitude, out of gratitude, he says, let me go and teach them the secret of happiness. Okay? And why did he do that? Out of gratitude. So the first lesson, the three, second lesson is this, and then the five ascetics. And then he remembered even before he went to teach the five ascetics, he remembered his three teachers. They had helped him, but not enough. He had to do the rest by himself. But he said, they helped me, but all, all of them had died. That's why he went to the... Uh, you, you know all of this, yeah? Then, again he remembered that he has a debt of gratitude to his father to his mother, all right? And he went and he taught his father. The father took a long time to become an Arahant. But before he died, thanks to the Buddha's help, the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha's sharing, yeah? The Buddha's... Why did the Buddha share with his father? Because he was my father. He, he gave me life, all right? And then his mother had passed away, as you know. Yeah? Then he remembered, where was she? She was in Tusita heaven. So at one time, he went up to Tusita heaven for three months to teach her, we believe, the Abhidhamma. And from there, she became an Arahant. Why did he do it? That was his first thought of gratitude. I have to, I have to help my father, I have to help my mother, and the best gift that I can give, there's a lesson here also, the best gift I can give is not material goods, but to teach them the secret of happiness. All right? And that's where we too, when we think of our parents, the only way we can really help them is to give them the gift of the Dhamma. But we'll come to that later. All right. Then, of course, Mahamaya Devi, that's his mother, and Yasodhara, his wife, yeah, he comes back and he teaches her the Dhamma and they all become Arahants eventually. So the first lesson <coughs> goes back to the very beginning of the Buddha's career. And gratitude is that important. That, this is what I want to emphasize here. Okay? All right. Uh, what does gratitude mean? Quite important because uh, later on we're going to have, wait, uh, just a minute. Um, yes. This concept of gratitude comes in the Mangala Sutra. I, I, I think you all know the Mangala Sutra and it, it goes like this. Garavocha Nivatocha Santutti uh, 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 katanyuta santutti cha katanyuta kalena dhamma savanam etang mangala muttamang you all know this and 
the, the Mangala Sutra, as you know, was where the Buddha was asked, what is the highest happiness? What is the greatest blessing? Compared to what other religions talk about. The Buddha says, there are 38 states of mind that you can develop. Just on an everyday basis. You don't need to be very clever. You don't need all the sutras. You just need 38 little points that will give you the highest happiness. Again, we come back to this word, the highest happiness. And among the 38, reverence. Reverence is where you treat the Buddha image properly, you treat monks properly as a reverence. Humility, contentment and gratitude, katanyuta. Hearing the Dhamma at the opportune time, this is the most of What we are saying is, here the Buddha is singled out as one of the 38 blessings. 38 blessing means not God blessing you, but you creating a blessed environment around yourself. I mentioned this, that you, you create your own heaven. And one of the ways to create your own heaven is gratitude. Okay. It's one out of 38. Well, now, so, the, the, the bottom line there, if you are grateful, it is make a sign you are making progress in the spiritual path. A person who is not grateful, yeah, cannot be happy. A person who is not grateful and doesn't know how to be grateful is on the wrong path. If you are doing things which are ungrateful, then you are on the wrong path. You got to come back. You got to test yourself and see whether this is right or wrong. Okay? If you are grateful, it is a sign that you are making progress in the spiritual path. Okay. What does gratitude mean? Okay, we talked about katanyuta. Okay? Duty to benefit us. Katanyuta. Benefactor, somebody who has done something good for you in any way, somebody has helped you in any way, you must be grateful to that person. Okay, right. But that is a benefactor. But before, now important point, yeah, before you can <coughs> uh, be grateful, you must know that something good has been done for you. You must know. This is this is tied up. <coughs> Welcome, sir. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks. Thank. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Shall we? We continue, huh? Okay. Right. So the <coughs> number one, katanyuta, to know. To recognize that something good has been done to you. This is going to come back later when we're talking about gratitude to parents, okay? Keep that at the back of your mind. Desire, not only, katanyuta does not only mean, thank you have done some good to me. Not only that, I must develop within me a desire to repay that kindness. That's the Buddhist way. Not just say thank you and forget it. Thank you, but what can I do to repay? So what can I do? Can, how do I physicalize my gratitude? Okay, right. Being thankful, readiness to show the gratitude. All tied up with parents. Okay, but later, yeah. Appreciation for and return to kindness. So these, these are the best uh, things. Okay, got a watch. Yeah? Okay. Kata, what has been done. And kat, Anyuta, Knowing or recognizing. No, something has been done, and we will explain this in a minute. Yeah? Knowing or recognizing what has been done involves not, you must know. You must know. You must not block yourself and not be aware. In, in our national level, also, we are so ready to criticize everything that's gone wrong. Yeah, but if we look hard enough, or not, don't have to look very hard, 
you can find many, many excuses to be grateful for what we are getting here. My simple question is, would you rather be in Afghanistan today? Okay, I sometimes find it very difficult to say this because my mind is saying something else, but this is a Dhamma talk, so I'm talking about gratitude. Okay, so knowing eh? What did the Buddha do? The Buddha knew that that tree had given him shade for the time that it took for him to become a Buddha. It provided, it was only a tree, but it provided the shade. He knew that it provided the shade, he was aware of it. And, and having known that, he did something about it. He said thank you to the tree by just gazing on it. Okay? And teaching a lesson. So, the point that we are making here so far is, it's not enough to be grateful. It's not that. What do we do to repay that gratitude? This is where the challenge comes. And we are all the time keeping at the back of our minds parents. And what has this got to do with parents? We are building the, the approach, okay? Right. Here it says, now there are two in the, in the teachings, yeah? One says there are three debts of gratitude. Another group, say, usually the Mahayana, they talk about four groups. But let's look at both. But both, both are very closely related. And we are talking about Katanyuta. Your, according to the Buddha's teaching, your first debt of gratitude is to your parents. That doesn't require much explanation. Okay? But your first is parents, then teachers. Why teachers? Because they carry on from where parents leave. They give you knowledge. Now we go into all of that. And then, unique in Buddhism, not emphasized in other religions, spiritual teachers, what we call Kalyana Mitras. Yeah? In Buddhism, we emphasize very, very much yeah, the importance of friends in our lives. Two types of friends. Friends who give us material help, one type, but more importantly, those who lead us, help us to practice the religious aspects, you know, and bringing them to the temple, meeting in the temple, doing this kind of temple activities, yeah, and those who help us in that direction, we are also grateful. So parents, teachers, and spiritual friends, and I think this is a Mahayana one, four, that's of gratitude, same thing, like parents, all living beings. This is very important in our present civilization. We are not grateful enough to the chicha, to the mosquito, yeah? We always think that by getting rid of them, our problems will be solved, uh-uh. They are there as part of the ecosystem, all right? And we, if we do not know that earthworm, yeah, when we are doing gardening and you find that worm and then, and then, if you don't like the earthworm, have you ever asked what the earthworm thinks of you? Yes, what if he looks at you and says, and throws you out? But anyway, uh, just the actual, if you do that and you kill that earthworm, you are changing the ecosystem. And we are paying the price for that, for not understanding what these things are doing for us. So, so the onus is on us to find out how they are useful. When we find out how they are useful, we will learn to respect them. Okay? For a long time, I didn't, I'm using the word earthworm because I didn't like earthworms until I found out how useful they are, how necessary they are for plants to grow. So now I'm grateful. Every morning I wake up, I go to my family earthworm and say, thank you. Okay, right. Um, and what do I do about it? What do I do about the benefit? What do I do about the, that earthworm? 
to show my gratitude, many ways of showing gratitude, etc., etc. Okay, then I don't know why only the Mahayana mentions this, Theravada doesn't. Government. We have to be grateful to the government. And we maybe have to look very hard, but we will find lots of reasons to be grateful. Okay, we will, we will, okay. Right then, of course, uh, parents, living beings, the government, but of course, higher level, gratitude to the triple gem. Buddhang saranangga chami, dhammang saranangga chami, sanghang saranangga chami. You can leave all the rest behind as you progress higher and higher. All right? And be grateful that it is this triple gem. Again, we have to know in what way. Buddha, in what way has the Buddha supported me? Why do I go to refuge in the Buddha? The Buddha cannot give me a passport. But the Buddha can help me. How? How can I be a refugee? Running away from what? We are all running away from suffering. We are all running, and where we are running, and where we are running to, to this safe place. Saranang. Saranang means like a sarang burung, like a nest. Where is a nest? A safe place. So I go to the Buddha just like a bird goes to its nest for security. And that's the highest. Yeah? Below that is the government, okay? So, Buddha, Saranang, and so on. Now we come to the Pokok Bichara, parents, yeah? We were just in the car with Brother Lai this morning when we were talking about how, how difficult it is for us old people to cope with the way young people think. Just can we just, I, I stopped going to airports. When, when, when I think of the digital there itself, it frightens me. So it's better stay at home. All right? Uh, this way young people think is so different from the way we, we think. And so there rises this social problem today of young and old not ngam not being able to see eye to eye. We don't know how they think, they don't know how we think. Their culture has changed so much. Of course, only in our lifetime, the time when grandparents lived with grandchildren was the accepted thing. It was normal. We didn't even think about it. Today, it says there, social changes. The nuclear family, father, mother, two children, Filipino maid. Okay, okay, I uh, may be uh, the, the dog. Okay, but, uh, and that's it. Yeah, and th this has a lot of reasons why. Because of urbanization, because land prices have gone up, etc., etc., etc. In those days, family house, father and mother, grandfather, grandmother, all right, get married, put an extra room, grandchildren come. All right, and then their grandchildren grow up, put one more room, and the house gets bigger and bigger. Today, it's not like that anymore. All this, yeah. Well, this has given rise to the conflict between parents and children. And we Buddhist groups are all the time concerned about what, what can we do about this? You know, how can we find good substitutes? The Western model, put them in old folks' homes. We are going there, but we know that's not the answer. That's not the answer, so we, we don't know. Maybe euthanasia is a better <coughs> bet. Okay, all right. Uh, the conflict between parents and children. And how many times have we heard this statement? Children telling their parents, I did not wish to be born. My late sister had a very famous saying, you all have heard about this. One mother can bring up ten children. Ten children cannot bring up one mother. You all know this, right? You cannot bring up one mother. Okay? So I told my sister, the, the 
ten children asked to come. They didn't ask to come. They are, they are stuck with you as much as you are stuck with them. Okay? And, but, but the problem is there. So parents in the past expected as a right that they will be able to live with their children. And yeah, even in those days, I don't think it was always that nice. Grandparents not necessarily had a good time. Okay? Luckily, there was a thing they nature invented called death. <laughs> Can you imagine if we live forever? Okay? All right. So, I do not wish to... Have. The Buddhist reply to the child who says, I did not wish to be born, the Buddhist reply is very clear. Yeah? You choose your own parents. That's the first thing. Okay? Remember, we are talking about gratitude. And we are now talking about why gratitude and how gratitude. All right? And one of the things we have to accept is you don't be grateful to your parents simply because of the birth in this life. You have to look past this life, karma. Yeah? And how karma affects, affects you. Yeah? That you know that at the moment of death, yeah, the, your last thought moment, if you're not an arahant yet, yeah, when you still have loba, dosa, moha, you still have attachment, yeah, your last thought moment is to be reborn. And reborn where? The, 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 the dying mind is looking. It's called a gandabha. This life, Rating to be born in the next life, the technical term for that is a Gandhabha. A Gandhabha is a being waiting to be born. Waiting for what? Waiting for a suitable parent. So here I am, dying, looking for a suitable parent, and ta-da, Tranganu Sultan's palace. <laughs> okay, you come, oh, happy, 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 Ching! Sultan's cat. <laughs> okay, why? Because my last thought moment was distracted by a meow. <laughs> okay, okay. But I did not wish you, you choose your parents. And if it's not suitable, it doesn't go. Sometimes you go in there and you die within three days or four days. You want to be Sultan's son? Okay. Yeah, but you tak layak. Matilah tiga hari, jadi kucing pula. Okay? So, you choose. This is a reason to be grateful. The reason I was born with, with you and, not, and no other parent, I was born as a human parent. I could have gone to animal parents or I could have gone into the hell world or wherever. But I am grateful that I was born in your house. So that's the first. Things may not be right this time, but I can do something about it. I am not the victim of my karma. All right? I may not like my parents. I may not agree with the way my parents brought me up or whatever, whatever. But with this understanding of karma, I will not let it continue. Let it continue. Maybe I think it's a nice time to share a little a story which went through my mind. Where, morning, uh, when, when, uh, uh, through my mind, uh, forgot when I saw that too. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hatred does not end by hatred. By love alone is hatred conquered. You know that one. Okay? What's the story behind that? There was a story that one day the Buddha was giving a sermon. And when the Buddha was going, suddenly there was a noise outside and a woman ran in with her baby. All right? And ran in with her baby and put the baby at the Buddha's feet and said, please protect me. All right? And everybody was wondering, what, what is it? Then the Buddha said, know what's happening. Outside is a she-devil. Hantura Pontianak ka apa tau. It's outside there because it's a sacred ground, she cannot come in. So the mother and the baby is safe. 
and the Buddha then tells the story of Kala Yaktini. Yeah, long, long ago, yeah, in a many, many lives ago, there was a woman. Yeah, she couldn't uh, bear children. She was not fertile, so she told her husband, "Have another wife." Okay, and the husband. I don't know reluctantly or not, but he quickly married another woman, huh? and quickly she became pregnant. And when she became pregnant, this first wife, who actually asked her to him to marry her, got jealous. And so what she did was she gave a poison, yeah, where which killed the a pregnant woman. That means the second wife was killed. Second wife knew about this, so before she died, she said, "I'll come, follow you. I'll come and follow you." So the next life, she was born as a fox. Number two was born as a fox. Number one was born as a chicken. Okay, so chase. Then, when the chicken was being killed, said, "I'll follow you." So was born as a snake. And came here. This woman was born as a chicken, still in the egg. So came and ate. So like that, temba, 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 temba. Seven generations later, of one hitting the other, this woman was again born into the human realm. Whereas the second wife was born as a devil, Pontiana. So when this woman became pregnant and had a baby, the Pontiana came. This woman knew what was happening. She ran to the Buddha. You got so far. So uh, then the Buddha said, "If you want to go through samsara, chasing out of revenge, hatred, does not cease by hatred. More hatred each time." So they were. The Buddha told them both to come in, sit down. Listen to the Dhamma talk. Give uh, forgiveness. Give for forgiveness, and then broke that cycle. What has that got to do with my talk? Your parents, you you inherit your parents in a karmic sense, right? And if you don't like the way that that arrangement is, do something to stop it. So don't create more anger. Don't create more hell for both parties. For which you need to know what your parents have done. On the face of it, maybe they are not doing good. But if you look deeply, there's not a single parent who does not deserve some kind of respect. And we will look at how the Buddha looks at this. Okay, All right? Why are we ungrateful? Not knowing, not like anyuta. Anyuta meaning you do not. Rec- I did not wish to be born. I did not wish to be born because you, my father and my mother, cannot give me a Lamborghini for my birthday. Okay, but if you look further than that, then there may be other things that we can look at, which the Dhamma teaches us to look at. Okay, one. Failure to recognize a benefit. Failure to rec- you you don't too many children today, and ourselves when we were young, yeah, don't bother to find out what it is that our parents did. We only know what we expect. Okay, right. So taking taking benefits of granted meaning, <coughs> I'm your son, what? So you have to give me what? I'm I'm going to get married. You have to give me the the my share. I am your son. So this is taking a benefit for granted, and of course, plain egotism, selfishness on both parties. But it is when we have egotism, egoism, when we have the I in front of everything else, that this is the one of the causes why we don't. Treat our parents right, okay? And most of the time, again, peer. I don't mean to be mean. I don't mean to be uh, not caring about my parents. I don't mean to treat my parents badly. I don't mean to re- disregard their needs. I don't mean it, but 
Mana ada masa nak tu buat tu tu semua. I am so busy, you know, running a company. You ask me to look after mother. You know, how many parents say that? Okay, our oh, worry. How many children say that? But here already I know going on in your minds, you as good Buddhists, good practicing Buddhists, are saying, okay, there is an answer to all of this. All right, because of the way we are looking at the Buddha Dhamma. Okay. Now, in the Mangala Sutra again, Mata Pitu Patanang Etang Mangala Muttamang. I think maybe you know this, but I will explain this again. Mangala Muttamang. The story goes that people were looking. I, I started off by talking about Buddhists look at happiness in a different perspective. Now, here is the uh, connection to that. Okay? These devas wanted to find out what is it that brings the greatest happiness. Greatest happiness, Mangala, translated as blessing. But here blessing means what Mangala. Gala is uh, uh, an unhappy state. An unhappy state, Mang. Gala cut. When you have an unhappy state and you Cut that unhappy state, then it becomes happiness. That's a mangala, that which destroys unhappy states. So, this deva asked the Buddha on behalf of humans, what are 38, uh, what are the highest blessings? What are the best ways in which this unhappy state can be cut? That's the meaning of mangala. And then the Buddha gives this 38. Yeah? And one of these is, one we saw was Katanyuta. Now we are looking at another one. Looking after one's, not mother, mother. One's mother. Oh. Oh, okay. Anyway. Uh, looking after one's mother and father. That is the highest blessing. Highest blessing. Okay? You cannot go higher than that. Yeah? Mother and father, not only for this lifetime. I had mothers and fathers in my previous lives. lives, And I'm going to have mothers and fathers in my future lives. All of them come under this thing, that I look after them. Okay? Looking after one mother. I don't know what you did for me. Yeah, don't don't blame me. I uh, how am I expected to know uh, before I was born what you did? Yeah. But if you take the make the attempt to find out, then you will realize. Take a moment to stop. This mother whom you don't like, this mother who you said ill treated you, this mother who said didn't care for you, but cared for the other brother. Yeah? Now, all these arguments that you have, stop and think. First of all, your mother, whoever she was, yeah, for nine months carried you in her womb. That is not a very comfortable thing to do. Yeah? Now, four days, five days, never mind. Yeah? But carrying nine months, I know I've been carrying this for 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay? <laughs> Pregnancy. This is a very, very difficult thing to bear. One. All right. After the nine months, belum bayar utang lagi. All right. The labor pains that come. Yeah. This is why no man can ever open his mouth. Yeah. That, that, that is why women have to count out. Men have to count out to women. The pay, bearing the pain of okay. Okay. Helping to forget the birth trauma. You know, as soon as the baby comes out, the first thing it does is cry. Right? Of course, the, the reason is it wants uh, breath. It wants air. But we, we say symbolically, the moment it comes out, it starts crying. Why is it crying? Nice, warm, comfortable inside. Suddenly, you are hung upside down, aircon there. Patut lah, you'll cry. On top of that, they'll whack you one. <laughs> Okay, but 
as soon as you are born, what happens? The mother takes you and cuddles you and holds you to, to, to give you that warmth, that comfort, reassures you. Yeah, You don't even understand what's happening, but the mother, in spite of the pain that she has gone through, all right, holds you and may help you to forget your birth trauma. Then the mother gives you her milk. That's the most complete diet. Yeah? She has sacrificed her own. I talk as if I went through all of this. <laughs> but the, 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 they, they say, I, I don't know about this, but they say that if a mother doesn't, uh, uh, what do you call it, feed herself well, feed herself well, the body takes it from her teeth and all of that. So all the nutrition is taken from the mother. The mother sacrifices that for the child to get the benefits. Okay? So sacrifice her own comfort, trying to sleep, you know, uh, nine months pregnant, little fella kicking in the night. Yeah? And the father saying, why are you disturbing you? Are? Okay, never mind. Tomorrow I talk. <laughs> okay? Right. Uh, cleanliness and purification. Baby is born. What does the baby do? It cannot do its own, uh, uh, clean itself. All right? So it's the mother. And the mother does not feel GG. The mother does not ask the Filipino maid to do that kind of dirty things. She does it herself. She does not feel dirty. Okay? These, these are things we, 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 we can't remember. But we have seen mothers doing it. So, if you stop for one day and think, this is what she went through just for my birth. What about my brothers? What about my sisters? And each time, yeah, without complaining, yeah, how much food she sacrificed. One of the saddest stories that I think about was in the 90s, late 90s, there was a famine in Indonesia. I don't know if you remember that, in, in uh, Sumatra the famine, and there was just no food. This is about 30 years ago. There was no food. But this mother, she had six children. Yeah? She went into the jungle and she saw a tapioca plant. She pulled out the tapioca plant and she found there were three tapiocas. Yeah? She brought it home, six children. Yeah? She brought it home, she cooked it, and she fed the children. There was not enough for her. So what did she do? She gave it all to them and she starved. Unfortunately, the tapioca was the poison type, had arsenic in it. All the children died, mother survived. Because she didn't eat, ma. What, what, a, what a tragic you know, ironic way. What a sick joke by, by, by nature. You know? that this is, and the mother so double whammy. La. Not only she lost her children, she had to live without the children after that. She had to live. If she had died, okay. okay? So these, these are the kinds of things we'll say that if we sit down and think, these are the kinds of sacrifices mothers make. All right. We are only talking about mothers. We haven't talked about fathers. That's waiting for the next uh, talk. Okay. Ah, just now we said, what is it that you have to do? What is brings the greatest happiness? And then knowing, etc., etc., etc. Now, next one: how to repay. A lot of people don't know how to repay. A lot of people think that repay means. Chinese New Year, get an ang pao packet and say na. And then of course pao pai pai. Okay. Is that what repayment means? Okay? No. Low priority, material needs. Uh -huh. I think if I ask to put up the hands, I'll know who the old people are. Long time ago, there was a uh, astro advertisement. And that astro advertisement showed an old couple in a new village, in a small wooden house, one electric bulb. Do you remember that? 
and they are sitting down there and reading the paper again and again. And they are just alone, very lonely, very sad. And the next side shows the son. He's in care, living in a grand house, you know, and feeling sorry for his parents and realizing that he must do something for his parents. So what does he do? He gives them an Astro subscription. <laughs> and they are watching Astro and they are happy. It was so ironic, they took it off. They, they, that, that, that advertisement for Astro was removed. Because it was so... That, that is not the way you pray. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so those, those are low priority, you give material needs. Middle priority, <laughs> don't give them headaches. Don't give them headache, all right? And high priority. This is where we come in, yeah? Teaching parents to escape from samsara. A lot of our parents, they are not educated. Not even if they are educated, they are not dhamma prone. They have no connection with the dhamma. Our bigger, like the Buddha with his parents and his wife. The first priority should be to help uh, them to escape from samsara. So teach, give them opportunities to practice Dhamma. Okay? This is how you repair. So remember, yeah, there are three. All are important. Even the low priority, very important. But that's not, yeah, there is, you go higher and higher. Okay? Right. Mm. O Brikus, just as Brahma extends metta, karuna, mudita, upeka towards all being in common at all times, so do these qualities grow in a mother. This is the Buddha talking about the four Brahma Viharas. You know four Brahma Viharas is our answer to heaven. Heaven is not something out there. Heaven is a state of mind. And that state of mind is that of a God. If you have metta, where you have loving kindness towards all beings that exist, every being, every mosquito, every ant, every chicha, every snake, if you have that same kind of love towards all beings in the universe, you are God. You are God. That, that's God's job. Yeah, his job description. Okay? So you want to be in Brahma Vihara? You want to be in heaven? Here is the way. Practice metta. But metta alone is not enough. You need karuna. Karuna is where you are in a happy state and others are not. We have a lot of that in Malaysia and we are very good at this. We practice karma. We practice karma in the sense that we do whatever we can to alleviate the suffering of others. Why? Because we have compassion. So metta, karuna, loving kindness, compassion. The next one, very difficult. Very difficult in the sense that we feel joy at other people's happiness. When other people are doing well and we are not, yeah, then we... Can we share that same joy yeah, and still give the vote to the same party? Okay? Because metta, karuna, mudita, and finally even higher than that is upeka. What is upeka? Upeka is a sense of not being disturbed by good or bad feelings, by being calm. Mostly Buddhas, Arahants can do that. That's why the Buddha is seen seated on a lotus flower. Why lotus flower? Because the lotus grows out of the mud. And it grows beautiful, but without being affected by the mud. Grows from the mud, but not affected by the mud. This is what we call upeka. Now, how does that apply to, that means heaven. Brahma, Vihara, heaven. How do you get to heaven? How do you experience heaven on earth? Yeah, A mother does that. A mother is symbolic of this. 
how just as brahma extends metta karuna mudita upeka towards all beings all times do these qualities grow in a mother now at birth what the mother goes through metta the, the when the baby is born crying two o'clock in the morning they ought to sleep yeah 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 we want to do the fathers will do this yeah mother will take and how much pain does she go through and there the the love that she experiences and she radiates that's metta child is sick stays awake why because of compassion for the child so she practices loving kindness she practices uh, compassion yeah then the child goes to school starts doing well eh? and sometimes mother had no education parents had no education but the child is doing well i've been a teacher as we are saying for 60 over years and in all these years i forgot the number of uh, graduation ceremonies i have attended okay but in all those graduation ceremonies i never met one father who was jealous that his son was getting the degree and he was not. and no father came to me actually as a my son cannot shouldn't get the degree i should get the degree no i did all the dirty work no here he the fellow useless balala never never so balenia he the poorer the father the prouder he is when his son is doing well i was teaching in swantan trengano now i'm meeting those little boys you know who were really really poor and now they are tansris yeah? and so the parents not jealous of them a mother or father feels the same pride okay? then even higher more difficult almost impossible for us putujanas yeah whether they are doing well or whether they are not we practice calm they are unaffected yeah a mother should once the children are grown up once the children have left and so on yeah don't harp on how much i did for my children nobody bothers about me yeah this is the time if we have planned well is a time to give up everything to renounce to start taking eight precepts to start taking 10 precepts letting go start getting ready to meet with your higher states of life okay so the buddha tells us that if you a a a a mother or a parent yeah is an equivalent of god that's what we are saying don't look for god outside in the temple the god is in the house we call that brahma at home the buddha calls parents brahmas so in a sense you are gods okay home is like heaven first school parents are the first teachers you know that first temple pay respects due to parents that's why we uh, we bow we worship we offer tea we have tea ceremony and all of that okay and the first place of offering when you get your job many of course you all know this i am a beneficiary i still have it in my pocket when my grandson got his first job he gave me 50 dollars worth millions it's i carry it with me all along every time so proud metta upeka okay right so the, so parents are these what parents can expect when we looked after them when they were young now they will provide for us you have a right if you are in the right culture and we mustn't lose that culture eh? they will protect us from trouble even forsaking their own engagements for our sake they will protect our wealth our good name and carry out ancestral practices in the sigalo vada sutra one of the duties of a son yeah is to upkeep the family life and uh, the family name one of the duties that a child has 
is to not spoil the bad name of the family. As a teacher, I used to conduct exams, and before the exam, everything ready, all seated there, I make an announcement. Please make sure you write your name on the answer paper, because otherwise we don't know who you are. So write your name. But don't write your surname. Why, why, why write the name but don't write the surname? I don't want you to disgrace your family. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they have to, they, they, that is your, your responsibility, not just your name, but your whole family name. All right? They will inherit our wealth and deal with that wealth wisely. This is open to question. But when we are there, this is the important one. This is where we as Buddhists stand out. When we are dead, they will perform the rites and transfer the merits to us. So Cheng Meng comes into the picture. Why it's such a beautiful uh, practice that must not be given up. All right. But remember, more than doing all of that when they were dead, it's much more important you do all that when they are alive. Yeah? Once they die, their karma will follow them. You cannot do anything after they are dead. So, how to repay? Considerate about their daily needs, be mindful about their health, give them comfort by letting them know they're always in our thoughts. Just, just a call, just to say, hi, how are you? Yeah? We must sincerely listen to the opinions of parents when they are right. Not necessarily parents are right. Different generation gap. Okay? We must teach parents about Buddhism, enable them to receive the benefits of the faith. That is our... And perform religious duties when one thing cannot agree, I cannot understand about some religions, is when they join that religion, they are told to throw away these age-old ceremonies like holding a joystick. Now, to them, even holding a joystick is sinful. Such a religion cannot have a wise God. Basically, I'd say this. You can change your religion, but you cannot change your, your inner nature. And these are things that have come from generations. So we must remember that. Yeah? And make sure that we follow. What is helpful? No, of course, one joystick is enough. You don't need to hope, pollute the atmosphere with the, what, what I call Vesak joysticks. Vesak joystick, 500, one fellow, comes once a year, pollutes the air and goes back. We have to clean up. Metta to them. <laughs> if a man can live a hundred years and nurse his mother on his right shoulder and his father on his left shoulder throughout his lifetime, feeding them and doing services with his own hands, even then, he will not be able to completely repay the debt of gratitude to his parents. And this is the Buddha's word and it makes so much of sense. All right? And we were, whole morning we were talking about what, what gratitude means, yeah? how to recognize it, how to repay. Yeah? And the Buddha says, nothing can beat this gratitude to parents. Okay? There's a Hindu saying, one religious teacher is worth 10 lay teachers. One mother is worth a hundred religious teachers. And one mother is worth a thousand fathers. Okay? Okay, now that being so, ask them to handle their own bank check. Though well to do, not to support father and mother who are old and past their youth, that is the cause of downfall. You want to suffer in hell? Neglect your parents. Para Bhava Sutra. Okay? May you all be well and happy. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is regarding grateful, uh, gratitude. Sorry, I think being 
ungrateful yes. in some way is a form of defense mechanism as yes. well. It's a, it's a way for survival. Mm. If we can't look at negative stuff, we're in possible danger. And also another thing is, if we're too grateful, the society won't develop or progress. Yeah. So, um, especially a bit personal as well, for me, my line of work, in a way, need to be ungrateful because I'm a programmer. So I need to look at things. Yeah. I need to see the worst case scenario. So what are your advice for this? Middle path. The middle path. While we are saying the past is good, we are not saying don't look to the future. The past was good given all its uh, limitations. All right? But the future is going into digitalization and so on. All right? So we need to have a wise balance between preserving the past, allowing for the change, there is impermanence, yeah? allowing for the change and preparing for the future. Uh, feeling guilty about it, very negative. All right? Take a problem, understand that problem in the light of all the circumstances around that, that problem and then make a wise decision. Okay? So are you saying that uh, gratitude is more for the past, but the future we can still... Uh, rather than the past, I would say present. Past is gone, but the gratitude is what I've inherited from the past in the present. How am I applying it? Uh, it's not a blind allegiance of gratitude. Okay? No. Take the country. Yeah, we are very grateful to the country, but things are wrong in the country. So we cannot sit down and say we be grateful. No, we have a moral obligation to do something about it. That's our, our uh, responsibility. So it's my responsibility to see what is wrong and try and do something about it without allowing anger, hatred, greed, jealousy to creep in. So we have to use our rational mind. So being gratitude but not being inaction. Yes, and irrational. Yeah, gratitude, uh, anything overdone is, is too much. We, we, we need to know where to draw the line. And that's what makes us Buddhist, the middle path. Okay. All right. And my second question is... Oh, God, second question, Dr. Da. No, no, only, only to only to only to only. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about the the high priority of yes to, for parents help them to realize the Dharma. Yeah. What if my parents are not Buddhist? How can you use skillful means? You know, you don't need to wear a yellow thread to call yourself a Buddhist. A Buddhist is someone who does not kill, steal, commit sexual, etc. Okay, one. A Buddhist is someone who follows the middle path. You don't need to be a Buddhist to be a Buddhist. Yeah? A lot of people, again, as a, as a teacher, I uh, was once, uh, I was in Inti College, and in Inti, I had, uh, students had to fill up a form. All right? And in that form, it asked for name, age, address, and everything. Then it came to religion. When it came to religion, this guy wrote, B U D D S H I T. Said, yeah, you are that, but you are not a Buddhist. You are a Buddhist. <laughs> you see, so we can all be Buddhists, yeah? but a Christian who doesn't kill, who doesn't steal, who practices uh, um, what do you call it, metta, without knowing it even, is a better Buddhist than me. Yeah? So Buddhist is not a, a label that we use. Buddhist is a practice, okay? Or practice of using the rational mind to be able to always look at the other side of the picture first, okay? And then come to a wise decision, okay? Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning, Uncle Vijaya. Yeah. 
uh, to add on to your sacrifices that a mother does, mm. I think you miss out one. That What? is postpartum depression. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Because it's a uh, quite a uh, normal for I, a mother mm. when they give birth. I that's know. what happening. I have a family member who's suffering through this. Yeah, yeah. yeah and very so frightening. So this is very tough for a mother to cope with her own physical It, changes plus coping with a new baby. Yeah, and probably siblings. The baby siblings as well. It's, it's not easy being my mother. Yeah. So perhaps that can be added on yes. so to show yes, how yes. great a mother is. Yes. See? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. And then another point is that uh, about the material gifts. You say uh, it's not so proper. That is of the lowest priority. Yeah. But uh, during the pandemic, I find that is the most, the best priority to give to a mother. That is to buy a smartphone. And teach our elderly mothers how to use because uh, from my experience, my mother was 80 plus, 86 during pandemic, and then none of us could visit her. So what we did oh, is that right. we buy her a smartphone right, very chunky right, right, and right. then teach her how to use. Yes. So she spent her time for about three years by herself only with that smartphone, and that helps her a lot. So she. Uh, Uh, she learned a lot from oh, YouTube, lovely. and then now she becomes a herbalist. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that yeah. is my experience. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, which also answers your question. You see how you deal with the circumstances as they occur. There is no mention of COVID in the sutras. <laughs> okay, but see how they wisely overcame a problem. Okay. Very, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that story. Yeah. Thank you. I wish I was your grandmother. <laughs> Do you have any more questions? Anyone? Or any comments? Okay. Mm -hmm. Teach the Dharma to parents, yeah. but when parents has dementia, you teach five minutes later they forget. Right, right. So you don't waste your time on that. Let them enjoy the, your joy, your caring, your met, your metta karuna mudita. No point in teaching them something they cannot register. Again, the same answer I would give this young man that the treatment. Must fit the occasion. The, the occasion has to be right. Now, during COVID, you said, yeah, when your grandmother is in hospital, uh, terminal, you go and send a handphone, no use. You see? So you have to. And also, out of the bad habit that they have, yeah. let's say the person is a gambler. Yeah. Uh, until when during the last uh, moment of death. Mm. The mind is still thinking of gambling. Yes. How do I help this elderly parent? I think Mahayana does that. When somebody is dying, the last thing they they chant, they just chant and chant and chant. Whether it goes in or not, there are vibrations. We strongly believe that in the atmosphere there are vibrations. These chantings, yeah, affect the vibrations, and these vibrations could. Future tense maybe could affect the guy's mental state. All right. So even if he's thinking of it temporarily, you can divert his mind from that to something uh, holy. All right. Something positive, and then he dies. But because his mind was not focused from young and free, he can only enjoy that diversion. For maybe a few days in the Sultan's palace. After that, he dies and becomes a gambling cat. <laughs> okay, if there is such Thank an you. animal. Eh? This is going to be what do you call it edited, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Uncle Vijaya. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. Today, I want to share my feelings. Yeah. Uh, today is my mother-in-law's fifth death anniversary. Oh, sad. <laughs> She 
I own the Mother's Day. Mm. And I may mean, she be well and happy wherever she is. She is the best mother, best mother in law and the best grandmother. <laughs> she took care of me during my four confinements, my four daughters and uh, other siblings' uh, confinement also. And uh, she took care of seven children. She took care of her children when my father-in-law passed away at a very young age. So I really love her and miss her. And may she be well and happy wherever she is. Sad, sad, sad. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And you are lucky. You have a good mother-in-law. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, sister. What we can do, of course, now is have, again, rational mind and radiate metta towards them, give them share merits. That's the only way we can have it. This is also part of it, part of our responsibility for like Ching Beng to think of our departed relatives. We cannot give them material goods, but we can give them metta. We can give them merits. So rather than transferring paper money or whatever, we say use that money to feed the poor and transfer the merit from there. So this is our, our way of doing things. Do we have any other questions or comments? Do have about maybe one? You can take one last question. Morning, Uncle Vijaya. Um, I just would like to uh, find out what do you think about Mahayana practice where um, they always have this practice of uh, copying sutta. Ah. That it will help to transfer merits or it will help to, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, take away some bad luck and all those. What is your thoughts? Well, any good deed any deed that is devoid of loba dosa moha, that means delusion, hatred, anger. Any such deed is positive. It creates positive vibes. Now, I would say that it is possible to transfer those positive vibes to whoever is on the other side. So that means when he's doing this, he has no anger, hatred, his uh, aim is good, as it certainly is, all right? And then he transfers it. It's definitely better than burning uh, hell paper, money, it definitely, because it's something positive. Yeah. So, second part of your question? No, that's no. only one. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. So, it is okay. It is okay because it is a positive thing. It doesn't create any disturbance to anybody. Uh, transferring the sutras means prolonging the life of the sutra. You are doing something very positive. You see? Yeah. 